so we are live good evening welcome to i focus oski special this is actually special special program for exam going postgraduate students wherein over six sessions of two hours each we are going to cover the entire ophthalmology in segmented as various sub specialties and this idea came from dr grover actually and uh, i think we took it up quite seriously Uh, the first talk today will be by Dr. Grover. As you know, he is the chairman of Sir Gangaram Hospital and the Vision Eye Center in New Delhi. He was the past president of AIOS and also uh, Asia Pacific Academy, Asia Pacific Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and uh, Ocular Plastics Association of India. Among apart from many other post, uh, positions that he holds, most important is that he is very uh, keen educator, and his uh, interest in resident education is known. as uh, when he was the president of aios he formulated the first uh, aios national curriculum which we still use uh, i request dr grover to come on and uh, start sharing his screen Can you see my screen share? Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm grateful to Santosh for this opportunity to be a part of this wonderful course on OSCE. It's a privilege and a pleasure. I'm grateful to Santosh for having taken up this idea to empower all of you in OSCE. OSCE is something that all those who are appearing in this particular dnb exam which is due in a few weeks um will all need but there are many others who will have various uses for it if they appear for frc of at some time or uh, frc edinburgh for some time for, uh, sometime of the in the future so it's a wonderful thing to know about oski and i'm going to introduce it to you before the different subjects can be taken up thank you again santosh santosh has been a partner for all the educational initiatives that we've done including the formulation of the curricula and both the uh, residency and the sub specialty and is a privilege to work with him so uh, we talk about oski why and how so we going to talk about what does oski mean why was it conceived or planned what are the merits of oski and the shortcomings how is it created how is it used in the frc of the examinations in the dnb examinations that are that are due how is it likely to be and we'll also talk about what help you can get in preparing for your oski examination and we'll just present you the various ways in which oski questions are presented to you so the oski stands for the objectively structured clinical examination that's quite obvious to you this examination form was initiated in 1975 by hedden and gleason it has become a standard tool for assessment both at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels all over the globe for clinical medical assessments and it is considered to be a precise objective and a reproducible evaluation tool to assess a very wide range of clinical skills now let's look at it why is it objective and why is it called a structured exam in contrast to a subjective assessment assessment here has been made objective by marking on a well defined scheme where each step that is performed is evaluated for being correct or incorrect 
in well-defined way, and then the marking is carried out. Now, the structuring implies that the skills to be assessed are identified and the, does it, does it, the examination is designed according to those skills to be, to be identified or assessed. And then the questions are structured accordingly and they are standardized by repeated testing on individuals who take the exams. So why did the um, need for OSCE arise? Well, because the standard clinical examinations, which you've all been through, has a number of shortcomings, which you are very well aware of. There is a large element of unreliability in testing students' performance. There is a huge variability between one examiner and the other. You know, even the FRCS examination that we take, the examiners are classified as doves and hawks based on their performance. And often an attempt is made to club a dove with a hawk. So there exists a wide variation in how examiners deal with examinations. And you're all aware of whether you're lucky to get a patient which you know all about or one which you don't know too much about. And similarly, what examiner you get picked to be examined by. So all these factors come in in a subjective standard clinical examination. So OSCE has certain advantages, other advantages other than the ones that we have spoken about, that in a shorter time, you can examine a larger number of students and pick up a broader range of subjects that you can assess. And since it involves many teams of examiners at times, in certain avatars of OSCE, the element of subjectivity goes down. And when the OSCE results are evaluated, you can easily objectively make out which areas the students are doing well whether they are doing well in clinical evaluation, whether they are doing well in the making diagnosis or in the surgical techniques. And you can identify the weak areas of students and you can modify your curricula accordingly. You can modify your teaching techniques accordingly. So these are the advantages that OSCE offers. And you can assess a very wide range of skills. So what is assessed when an OSCE exam is held? your clinical skills and technical skills in various things like a particular investigation or a particular surgery, they can all be assessed by OSCE. It assesses your ability for a structured and logical thinking by questions specifically designed for it. It can check whether you have the interpretation and problem solving ability, your diagnostic reasoning, your ability to identify which investigations to be requested and how well you can interpret them, how well you can interpret images and data, and how well you can handle a patient clinically. Also, your communication skills and professional technique can all be looked at through an OSCE examination. And this will become clear when we talk about the methods that are used or the types of questions that are asked. Postgraduate level, there are certain more uh, things that can be assessed. Finer decision making is often assessed in post at the residency level. It is used for graduate examination as well as postgraduate examination. So when it is dealing with postgraduates, your finer decision making is also assessed. Handling of complex management issues may be assessed. Management of emergency situations is sought to be assessed. And complex uh, communication situations like breaking bad news. 
or unpredictable patient behavior. These can also be assessed by OSCE. And your ability or data interpretation is looked at closely. Your management and administrative abilities where required may also be assessed by OSCE. So to summarize some of the advantages and disadvantages of OSCE, it presents a uniform scenario for all candidates. It can be done carried out easily by uh, not being dependent on availability of patients, which can be a major factor, especially in some of the Western countries. And you don't risk injury to them or uh, handling of the patients. The risk of medication also is a problem in the West. And here you often use actors who also give you valuable feedback. The advantages are that the organization holding it needs to be trained. And you often use textbook scenarios when you train the actors, which can be a problem because uh, they always don't mimic the real life situations. And it can be expensive to hold an OSCE examination. When an OSCE examination is to be organized, you need to identify an OSCE team. You need to decide what exactly you're planning to assess. You design your stations accordingly. You prepare a, an objective marking scheme and you recruit, uh, recruit either patients who've been standardized or volunteers and prepare the OSCE questions. And then you have to do the logistics to hold the examination. So how is it done in the FRC examinations? They have uh, six stations. Five of them are for uh, the clinical patients or subjects or volunteers. And each station is for 20 minutes. And all these are different areas are assessed, anterior segment, glaucoma and lid together, posterior segment, strabismus and orbit, and neuroophthalmology. So the candidates rotate like this between station one, two, three, four, and five, with a five minute gap in between for marking. Two independent examiners at each station with a volunteer or with a patient will assess, mark independently without discussing with each other, and those, and any Significant differences between two candidates, between two examiners assessment of a candidate are closely looked at. So when you have a national board examination coming up in this COVID era, there will need to be certain modifications. You may not have volunteers for the OSCE examination. It will be done as uh, centralized examination projected on a screen from the um, central DNB office. And you'll have about 10 to 12 people in a hall who will be answering all the 25 stations sitting at one place. So this will be a 200 marks OSCE examination with 25 stations of eight marks each. You'll also have a Viva Bose which will again be divided into four different uh, areas, anterior segment, posterior segment, neuro, squint, pediatric ophthalmology, and so on. And there will be two clinical cases, which may be real or which may be simulated, or which may be done on mannequins, your examination skills may be checked and so on and so forth. That will be 60 marks. So you need to get 150 marks to pass. So um, as we said, it will be by transmission from the NB command center and the assessment will be done at the national board office. But OSCE are not new to national board examinations. They were started some 25 years ago and uh, ophthalmology was the first one to start with OSCE in the national board. And uh, that time I was lucky to be associated with the formulation and training of several centers in the country. We traveled and trained these centers in preparing for national board examinations uh, by OSCE. And 
we could carry out several successful examinations in OSCE till because of Commonwealth Games, one year they could not be the faculty of uh, the center which was doing it got busy with the other work. So it got discontinued because they could not be prepared. So that's last 10, 15 years, it has been done as a routine examination. So how do you prepare for an OSCE examination? We look at the available resources, like there are books available like this. It's available on Amazon. You have some other books which are on OSCE examinations and there are other resources on the net so you can look it up. You can Google it and you'll find a lot of them. So finally, let's look at what to expect in your examinations. What are the kind of questions that may be framed? So you may have a clinical photograph on which you may be asked. Now, this is very easy. I think um, somebody can answer this. What, is the, um, what does this face suggest to you? Zero derma. Uh... Okay, so zero derma pigmentosum. Yeah. Then you may be asked questions like this, which are broken up into those which can be objectively assessed. What is the clinical diagnosis? If you write it right, you get the um, a full mark, genetic defect associated with the condition, type of inheritance, write three common associated features, mention three modalities in the management of the condition. So I'm sure once you know the basic condition, these questions are not difficult and you can score eight with this. So, uh, who'll answer this, Arushi? Golden heart. Mm. Uh, Look at it again. This is golden heart. It's not golden heart. Because there's a premolecular tag and uh, the oh. lid coloboma. Okay, there is a lower lid coloboma. Usually, uh, usually we have upper lid in uh, golden heart. Yeah. This was a treacher Collins. Micrognathia, mandibulofacial dysostosis. So clinical diagnosis, inheritance pattern, clinical features, choice of technique for management of coloboma repair in this patient. All ones you can do a direct closure in this one. You may have clinical problems pointed out to you. For example, you have this cataract patient who needs surgery. Biometry shows this and Keratometry is 47.54 and 44.33. So what are the various four options to correct astigmatism during cataract surgery? What is the best option for this patient? What if further evaluation shows that this patient has keratoconus? Then how will you manage it? What is bioptics? So all that you can answer objectively and you can get nearly full marks. Another situation, a congenital cataract in an 11-month-old child, which is visually significant, needs bilateral surgery, be scan normal. What investigations would you like to do? So, Arushi or Muskan? Uh, uh, torch infections we rule out. Uh, the 2D echo can be done. Okay, so essentially, when you have a bilateral one and possibly from birth, you would need to investigate for etiological factors that you suspect. So that will be important. And then the question is, what is the most appropriate management in your view? How will you decide the IOL power? Should you choose to put an IOL? How will you man manage if no IOL is placed? So you will have to talk about the aphakic scenario, bilateral aphakic scenario. You'll have to talk about the um, IOL power calculation as well if you were to choose. So that's why a borderline age of 11 months, possibly beyond two years, you would certainly do it beyond one year also. Most people would do an IOL. So that's why a borderline age where questions can be asked for both. Then you may be asked to interpret an image. So this is... Uh, a coronal cut. Now, can you tell me what do you see? Blowout fracture. Orbital floor fracture. Okay, so you can see an orbital floor fracture, even though 
there are no clinical signs there is a history of a blunt trauma and then you need to answer these questions related to that so that sometimes the questions will offer you a clue so if you did not diagnose a fracture when a fracture question comes up later you can go back and look at the picture again so take a clue from whatever is written here look at all the four questions first and go back and see your image so that can be helpful similar clues may be offered to you on histopathology slides okay you need to give a diagnosis look at the cytological features look at the uh, morphology of how the cells are placed whether there are keratin pearls or whether there is palisading and make a diagnosis write the characteristic diagnostic features so you may have a combination with imaging clinical diagnosis webho this is neurofibromatosis okay so what are the clues that you are getting uh, sir there will be pulsatile proptosis in uh, Uh, I'll maybe may not be unless you've seen the imaging. You can't say that, but you see certain changes here. Can you see a boosthalmos, and you can see a large baggy kind of a thing, a bag of worms feeling on palpation would be quite evident. And and there are other changes. All this is hanging out. There'll be plenty of signs, and you can see the defect on imaging. and then you can talk about all the things about the imaging about the histopathological features about the common presentations so all these can be then marked out you will have eight marks well distributed which you can take up there may be a microbiology slide can you identify this describe the morphological features look at this closely what are these muskan the spore forming hyphae uh, the uh, fungus and uh... okay then what else will you look for will you look for septae septae you want to identify the organelles uh... you need to look at the presence or absence of septum which will help you identify muca and then you talk about what is the disease what happens in the eye and what are the medicines most effective for therapy then you may have surgical procedure either as a picture look at these two closely tell me subhadra can you tell me what Sir. is being done yeah um what is being done here is uh, fat so we injecting the fat in uh, below just in the subcut subcut for uh, wrink wrinkles and uh, okay maybe maybe for correction so we like to know the indications where do you pick it up from and identify the procedure great now look at this video electroepilation mm, not really we would you do like this oh, yeah. no this is Come the Splitting. Yes. Uh, this is for dystichiasis. The splitting of the. You can see dystichiatic thing. We need to identify that. So a lid splitting is being done, and the part bearing the cilia arising from the meibomian gland openings are being excised, and then you'll possibly put a graft here. So you need to identify that the procedure, condition being treated. causes for the clinical condition and the other modalities used for the management of the same condition so questions like these so a video like this so there may be questions related to it so you'll have a clip not exceeding a minute because uh, then you need to have the rest of 4 minutes or so to answer the thing So you can see what is being done. Then and then opening up the posterior tendons and implant being placed and so on and so forth. 
So the questions will be linked to that. Indications for the procedure, what implant is being used, methods to decide the appropriate size of the implant, and causes of implant exposure. So the questions will often give you a clue to what the procedure is, but you need to be specific in answering. Because a two will mean that if you write both right and they are most important ones, it's very easy to secure these two marks. So there may be various other uh, questions. They may be related to clinical optics. They will be clinical scenarios. There will be no real benefit, obviously, this time because uh, or simulated patients in this OSCE because of the nature in which it is being done and the times in it and which it is being done at the COVID time and patients are difficult to call. These may be related to surgical instruments or appliances that may be shown to you. Can anyone identify this? Maybe we should give another um, uh, view of this for you to identify. It may be related to ocular therapeutics, clinical genetics, counseling, eugenic communication skills. So all these aspects and many more. There's, there are no limits identified for what can be useful. There will be investigations, clinical investigations, maybe an angiogram, maybe a uh, OCT for you to comment upon what the changes are. So um, the examination can be daunting for anybody because the greatest fool may ask more than the wisest man can answer. So the examinations can be quite formidable. But you are lucky. You will not have an examination like this. So this is an opportunity to, for in this crisis being afforded to you to have an objective examination. Okay. So recognize this opportunity. As Ann Lander said, opportunities are usually disguised as hard work. So most people don't recognize them. Recognize your opportunity. It is a major opportunity for you to be appearing in an objectively structured examination. Enjoy it and you will do very well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, always a pleasure to listen to your talks and uh, uh, it's great for the students that you were involved with this OSCE for a very long time and you were able to introduce the whole concept to them and also run uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Let me just stop screen sharing. Participants can put on their videos. Meenakshi wants to see their faces. <laughs> <laughs> Rashmin, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so next we have uh, Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan coming to us from Chennai. Uh, Dr. Minakshi is, again, an extremely popular and well-known face in uh, academic circuits. She was the one who has been responsible for building and uh, enhancing the academic program at Shankarnitralia. And I remember at this juncture, a lot of OSCE programs that we used to conduct together. And it was fun to, to make those OSCEs. And... Uh, Vinakshi, all yours. She's a pediatric ophthalmologist and a screen specialist. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh. Thank you so much, Rashman and uh, Team CFS. Um, welcome, participants. And I'm just going to uh, read off the names and uh, I want to confirm that you are a participant so that inadvertently I'm not asking questions to uh, the poor admin people. So let me start off by asking uh, Dr. Shubhadra. I, can you wave? All right, lovely, Dr. Shubhadra. Uh, which uh, which program did you train in? Where did you train um, at? Um, I'm just doing first year in off talent. You are doing first year and off talent. You are such a brave person, doctor. Anyway, welcome to the program. All right. Um, next is um, is Dr. Muskan, one of the one of the uh, participants in the hot seat. Dr. Shubhadra, you can put yourself on mute. Yes, ma'am. Is Dr. Muskan here? Speak up, you're muted, Muskan. 
Yes, unmute good yourself. Evening. Are you one of the good participants? Evening, good evening. Uh, good evening. Yes, ma'am, I'm the participant. Uh, I just completed my MS of the from PGI Chandigarh. PGI Chandigarh. Lovely, Dr. Muskan. And uh, the question about. Uh, I, uh, my voice was not audible. Uh, you can unmute your. You can sorry mute yourself, Dr. Vaibhav. Are you up? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'm. Uh, I've just started my third year, and I am from Gurunanak Eye Center, New Delhi. Lovely, Dr. Vaibhav. Thank you, and Dr. Harsh. Uh, unmute yourself, Dr. Harsh. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. I'm. Uh, I have uh, done my DNA from the Stoke Hospital in Mumbai, so I'll be appearing for my uh, practical exams on fourth uh, of August. Lovely. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Madhurya Gupta. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I have done my DNA from Alaknen Eye Institute, Udaipur, and I'll be appearing for my practical on fourth of August. Lovely. Thank you so much. And Dr. Vineet. Ma'am, I done my uh, uh, third year residency DNB from Global Hospital Abu Road, and going to appear for. Thank you, ma'am. Lovely. And uh, it, there is a Dr. Amar here. Is there a Dr. Amar? Yes. Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm here. I passed out my DNB from MMB Hospital last year. Else is there? Um, Doctor Mritika. There is not a participant. No, ma'am, I'm not a participant. I'm a fellow. I'm just. No, no, no. Doctor Sandeep. I'm a grower, and I'm going to mute myself myself so that you can't ask me any questions. All right, all right. Thank you. You can be asked questions. <laughs> No sir, no sir. I'm sorry. Is that all the participants? Is Dr. Tanvi there? Yeah, Tanvi is here. Tanvi. Tanvi, unmute yourself. I think she's hiding. <laughs> Dr. Ramar as well. Yeah. All right. Okay. If that is all, uh, I want to I want to confirm that these people are all here: Muskan, Shubhadra, Vaibhav, Harsh, Mahal, Bini, Amar, Tanvi. Anybody I have left? Akshay Deep then. Doctor Akshay Deep has been left. He was also a participant. Akshay Deep. Let me see. Ak Akshay, speak up. Akshadeep, I see that. Akshadeep, can you speak uh, up? Yes, where are you from? Hello. Okay, Akshadeep, okay. All right, let, you know, uh, uh, there are always challenges of having an interactive session uh, online, but we're going to go right ahead with it. And um, so let me start off by saying a few uh, ground rules here. Uh, let me put up the, uh, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a first round of questions. This is pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. And I will call out your name and then I will put up the question. And you have, uh, in the first round, we are going to keep it open. I'm not going to time you. Remember, this. even though this is OSCE, I can't have you sitting and writing answers. We'll all go to sleep. So this is going to be more like a table viva. So you're going to have to read the OSCE questions with the marks that are awarded for each que sub-question and then start shooting the answers. Okay, so this is like a table viva. I want to impress upon you. After the first round, we are going to time you for the second round. All clear? So we're going to start off and with uh, a few more um, you know, things that you have to anticipate. Let me screen share. Let 
Hang on just a second. Light show and start. Is my screen visible? Yes. All right, lovely. Yes, ma'am. So as Dr. Grover gave us a wonderful start and an overview, and he talked about how there will be 25 questions, eight marks per question, five minutes per question, and for a total of 200 marks. Remember, the OSCE is going to be your major component in the DNB finals this time. So I'm going to tell you a few OSCE hacks, okay? So when you start and you see this question coming up, and when it says 1A, when you see that A means this is one of two parts, don't dwell on it too much. You're going to have to switch at two and a half minutes to, because the slide will switch at two and a half minutes to the second part. So beware when you see this A. Next, you know, when you look at it, you know, oh, you know, this is something going on in the lid. It's good to put on the specialty hat, but be Keep an open mind because can everybody else put their mics on mute? I'm hearing children, I'm hearing grandparents, I'm hearing music, I'm hearing crows. It, it's it's lovely and lively, but please put it on mute. Thank you. To so describe. It says describe and then says risk factors and then says differential diagnosis and suddenly it says histopathology. Okay, so you're going to be caught away, unawares. So keep an open mind. And before that, I want you to remember, first go do, do a quick glance at the marks. Okay, look at everything once quickly. For example, look at, look at this one. It says... Um, 40 year old presents with fullness of the left upper lid for... Uh, one month, then look at the marks. It says, describe the photo. What structure is in this area? Mm -hmm. How is the investigations? Remember that the marks are already clearly there. And so don't spend too much time. Uh, make sure you're quickly looking at the marks and spending more time on investigations because it carries five marks. So a quick glance is very, very essential. Um, I fortunate I have lovely students. One of them wrote to me after the ENT Oscars that happened yesterday, and she said, "Believe it or not, there was a tsunami." That is, yours. Look at this question. You've just found out that your neighbor is on home quarantine for mild COVID nineteen symptoms. Apparently, there were three questions on COVID. What is COVID nineteen? And it might be COVID in the ophthalmologist. So be prepared for COVID questions in this era. So we're going to start off. I was going to start with Musan. Musan, are you there? Yes, please unmute. Yeah, please unmute. And I want you to read out the questions with the marks as you go through this. Please go ahead. Start. Uh, identify the test one. Uh, and this is the uh, Lee charting wait, that wait, wait, we do wait, for. Read the, whole thing. read the whole thing because only then you will know how much marks, how much time you have to spend. So go quickly read the whole thing. Identify, the, Identify test. the test. What is the principle of this test? What is the affected eye? What is the uh, what is the underacting muscle? What is the overacting muscle? And what is the diagnosis? So this is the okay. Lee charting, which is based on the principle of haploscopic uh, principle. And uh, the affected eye here is the uh, left eye. And uh, the underacting muscle is the uh, superior oblique. And uh, the overacting muscle uh, should be inferior oblique. And uh, the diagnosis would be left superior big palsy. Okay, wonderful. You did great. But you can't say it must be. It's whatever is there. So which is the, which is the eye that shows the arrows? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the right eye shows the arrows. But uh, right, that right, is the right. bigger in size compared to the left eye. No, so no, no, the you're, eye... Wait, wait, you're right with everything. The arrows just tell you that the overacting muscle might be the inferior rectus, the yoke muscle of the other eye. Okay? Yes. That's all it means. And so let's see how you are right with the answers. I'm going to give you the answers right away. So I have put the, the uh, questions again here. Yes, it's his chart, charting or his chart, his screen. 
Povial, what's the, what is the principle of this test? What, what did you say about the principle of the test? I said haploscopic. Haploscopic, but for two marks, you may have to write a little bit more. So what I would expect you to write, this is based on foveal projection and dissociation of the eyes, which is what you mean by haploscopic. Herring's law and Sherrington's law is what is used to find out the underacting, overacting muscles. So affected eye, left eye, full marks, underacting muscle, superior oblique. And what is the mistake that I have done here intentionally? I've not mentioned the eye. Correct? You have yes, to write yes. the underacting muscle is the left superior oblique. And what is the overacting muscle is the right inferior rectus. Right. And the diagnosis, you're absolutely right, is the left superior oblique palsy. Very good. So, Dr. Muskan, and we go on next to Dr. Shubhadra. You ready, Dr. Shubhadra? Yes, ma'am. All right, Dr. Shubhadra, read out, yes. and I want you to read the marks along with it for you to for you to impress in your head that how much marks each question has. Yeah, go ahead. Describe what you see. What is the diagnosis? Wait, wait, wait. I want you to read it like this. Describe what you see for two marks. What is the diagnosis? One mark. What is the modified Newcastle score? Three marks. I want you to read like that. Describe what you see for two marks. What is the diagnosis? One mark. What is the modified Newcastle score? Three marks. What are the non-medical therapies available to treat this condition? Two marks. Lovely. Um, okay. Let's yes, have your Okay. I don't so, know. there are two photographs, right? Yes, ma'am. So, first you start by saying photograph on the, the first photograph and the second photograph, which may be easy because if you start writing the right and left, you don't know whether you're talking about your right or their right. Yes, so, first photograph. What do you see? What do you see in the first photograph? Uh, the patient uh, uh, left eye, uh, she is trying to see towards the left, um, but the uh, in right eye is uh, ortho, she's seeing straight. Uh, uh, so I'm suspecting. Okay, Santosh, Rashmi, I may have to actually even teach a little bit of uh, squint here. So I hope you don't mind. So let's look at this photograph. So if you look at the first photograph, the light is centered on the left pupil, correct? Can you see the light centered in the left pupil? Which means the child is fixing with the left eye. Which means the right eye is deviated outwards. Also known as exotropia. You heard of that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, All right. But when you look at the next photograph, the second one, yes, light appears to be centered in both pupils. And you would okay, call orthotropia. Okay, ma'am. That is all the description you have to do. Always yes. the light is centered in which pupil and go from there to describe yes, the So what is the diagnosis? You see exotropia in one picture and don't see it in the other picture. So what is the diagnosis? Uh, uh... Medial, uh, uh, lateral rectus. Uh, uh, okay, so here medial is rectus. Okay, I uh, see so you, uh, Muskan, are the first year. I mean, so Shubhadra are the first year, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, so I, I mean, I completely understand. Uh, by Even by third year, our students are trying to figure out uh, which rectus is doing what. No problem. But the clue for the others is in this particular uh, uh, OSCE, if you're not sure what is going on, what are they asking? You, you, the clue is reading the OSCE fully. So in the middle is modified Newcastle score. And of course, when you come to your exams and you've read for your exams, you will know that the Newcastle score is used for grading intermittent exotropia. So then it quickly, that is the whole idea and purpose of reading all the sub questions once and then starting to answer. Because suppose you're clueless what is going on, the Newcastle score will immediately tell you, oh, okay, they are asking me about intermittent exotropy or intermittent divergent squint. And then the rest of it falls into place. So that is the reason, again and again, I'm telling you, read the whole thing to look for clues. So here, the Newcastle score is your clue, okay? So let's move on to the answer. So I will not, uh, you know, bore you. So the first photo shows right exotropia. Second photo shows orthotropia. 
the, what is the diagnosis? Intermittent exotropia. What is modified Newcastle score? I'm asking you, I'm going to ask you to write down the broad heading of the Newcastle score. You may not have time to write the whole thing down. So just you will write in your answer, office control, home control, office control at near an office, office control at distance. That's all you will write. What are the non-medical therapies available to treat this condition? Over minus therapy, prisons, alternate occlusion. All right. Lovely, Shubhadra. That was, a, that was a very bold attempt for a first year to try and answer a, a tough school question. Next, we're going to ask uh, Babha. Is Dr. Babha here? Yes, ma'am. Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Babha? Done, ma'am. Yes, and when you're ready. Yes, ma'am. So, what? So, go ahead and read with with the uh, marks. Go ahead. Uh, what is the name of this uh, procedure? Um, uh, two marks and what other similar procedures do you know? Two marks. What are the indications? Two marks and what are the complications? Two marks. Lovely. Um, uh, this is uh, a former's augmentation procedure and uh, formant's augmentation procedure done for uh, lateral, rectal, lateral rectus uh, paralysis and uh, yeah, and then so what are the similar procedures? Do you know, this is not the answer, but your your indication is very good. Indication is uh, a lateral rectus. Hamelstein procedure and Jensen's procedure are the other two procedures. Excellent, excellent. And uh, what are the complications? Uh, ma'am, uh, complications, uh, ma'am, the patient, uh, the elevation and the depression uh, of the patient is uh, uh, suffers because of this, and. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. That's what uh, all I know. All right. So, so uh, wonderful at, uh, attempt, and the answer is actually modified nishidas. But if you write uh, somewhere transposition, if you use the word transposition somewhere, you will get more marks. So, where you it says nishidas modified nishidas procedure, if you write transposition, you will definitely get one out of two marks, even if you wrote some other procedures. And the rest of you were absolutely right. Uh, lateral rectus palsy is, is probably, in my, if I was marking, I would give one and a half marks for lateral rectus palsy and MED, maybe another half mark if you. And the problem is that adherence to sclera, elevation depression, not that uh, 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 much of a problem, but anterior segment ischemia, if you're not careful in, in, uh, in, in dissecting and if you injure the muscle, it's always a problem with uh, transposition. That was an excellent uh, Dr. Weber. Now we'll... Uh, go to the next question, and for this, we're going to have, um, uh, oh, there's my question. Right. So, uh, Dr. Harsh, let me ask Dr. Harsh, are you ready? Yes, uh, I can't see the question, but... You can't see the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Uh, yeah. Dr. So, Hush, shall I read, read out the question? A six year old boy present with squint in the right eye since birth. What is the diagnosis for two marks? Wait, 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 so, wait. And how will you manage the patient that is again for two marks? Read the scenario, doctor. Read the whole scenario on the left. Okay. Uh, six year. Yeah. A six year old boy presents with squint in the right eye since birth. The vision in the right eye is 6 by 60, vision in the left eye is uh, 6 by 6, and uh, cycloplegic refraction is uh, 0 0.050 uh, for both eye, and rest of the examination is normal. What is before the cycloplegic refraction? So, what is the diagnosis? Wait, wait, what is, the, what is written before yeah, that, cycloplegic refraction? That is the key here. Don't, don't miss it out. What is okay, that is uh, RCS. What? Yeah, I'm not really sure what stands for uh, RCS. Yeah, I'm not sure what is RCS. Okay, I'll give you a hint because I'm nice. It's right convergence quint. Okay, right convergence quint is RCS. Okay, okay. what is the diagnosis? Uh, so, our uh, diagnosis is uh, um, uh, amblyopia in the right eye because of the squint. Converging uh, squint in the right eye. So this is also known as strabismic amblyopia, correct? Strabismic amblyopia in the right eye. How will you manage the patient? So uh, uh, 
full refractive correction can be given since it's a isotropia so full correction can be given I with glasses first will uh, first refractive correction will uh, give first with uh, full corrective glasses doctor the patient and, refractive uh, point five so yeah That's so we can we can, we can try with for the occlusion therapy occlusion therapy initially we'll patch the good eye and uh, at least for 2 to 3 hours a day and uh, advise the mother to take care that the child uh, looks with the other eye uh, does his daily work with the other eye okay you're not going to write stories though on the exam you're just going to write occlusion of the left eye okay occlusion therapy okay. Okay. what you will write what will you do if to improve uh, if the patient is not compliant with occlusion what are, what other things do you have uh, in in your armamentarium what else do you have uh then uh, then we can uh, use a spectacle with a patch or a uh, or a occluder doins occluder or we can uh, do atropine penalization lovely you can do a penalization and so i'd ask you another question what is the evidence for your plan the plan of occlusion is not 2 hours per day but this 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 category of amblyopia is called a 660 vision is called severe amblyopia okay and for severe amblyopia okay. we patch 6 hours a day and this is based on what what is the evidence what, like like what is the study or in literature that says hey you need to patch 6 hours per day for this amblyopia what is that Uh, amblyopia treatment study ATS. lovely doctor so, lovely lovely amblyopia treatment study that's exactly right ats so i got a bit lazy and wrote ats but you should write the full form in the exam and you're absolutely right strabismic amblyopia in the right eye occlusion but 6 hours per day and amblyopia treatment study and penalization wonderful we're doing lovely let's have dr madhurya are you ready dr madhurya thank you yes ma'am all right i'm trying to find your face there you are All right, let's go to the next one. Go ahead and read it, doctor. Uh, describe one mark diagnosis. One mark. Describe embryological development of hyaloid system, and describe difference between anterior and posterior lens capsule. So, okay. uh, uh, yeah. so this uh, for this for this description, this looks like a mitten of dot. Mm -hmm. Mitten of dot. Right. Correct. so uh, it looks like a uh, but but that's not the, that's not the description yes, that is the diagnosis mm -hmm. so how would you describe it on the in the on the retro illumination mode i can see a, a, a hyper reflective foci uh, in the uh, lenticular area most probably yeah, sorry, towards sorry. the posterior side you can see probably in the <laughs> area yes okay and in the posterior towards the posterior side of the capsule posterior yeah, towards the posterior that, capsule yeah that is and, hard to say because you don't have a, a parallel of people you don't have a slit but that's fine if you say it's in the lens that is good enough and diagnosis you said it's mitten dots dot and um, i'm not going to go into the uh, you know you have to do, and it's and so in this uh, oski the focus is four marks on the embryology okay mm -hmm. so make sure you write about primary secondary tertiary vitreous if you have uh, leave a little space nearby if you your description if you have if you can put a quick diagram and uh, uh, what is the difference between anterior and posterior lens capsule uh the uh, the anterior lens cap capsule is uh, relatively very elastic as compared to the posterior lens capsule and uh, uh that's the only thing what else it's also it's also thicker posterior is thicker as compared to anterior and i thought anterior is thicker yes and there, there is also um epithelium uh, attached to the uh, just below the anterior capsule which is not there in the posterior capsule okay but yes. sir the i want to again impress upon you that you have to draw a diagram if you have time because four marks have been given to the uh, hyaloid system embryology okay yes ma'am um, yes ma'am lovely now let's go to dr um, vineet are you there dr vineet 
Yes, ma'am. All right, Dr. Vineet, uh, go ahead and um, let's go to the next question. Yes, please read. A four-year-old child okay. undergoes cycloplegia with cycloplanteloid in office. Pupil dilated, dilating poorly. What could be the cause of poor dilatation? Two marks. What else you can offer this patient? Two marks. How will you consult the patient regarding precaution and side effect? Four marks. Okay. Yes, sure. Yes, Go ahead and answer. Ma'am, uh, the cause of poor dilation may be uh, atrophy of uh, iris or uh, uh, dilator muscles. You've seen children, right, doctor? Four I'm years sure earlier. Seen children in pediatric ophthalmology. Yes, ma'am. So usually, what causes poor dilation? Uh, paralysis of the mem muscles and uh, dil. Uh, Sphincter muscles are not uh, acting there. Okay, go ahead. Fin uh, finish your. Uh, what else can you can offer this patient with poorly dilates? Uh, atropine, ma'am, less than five year old child. You can give. Uh, you can offer atropine refraction. Yeah. So, how will you counsel the parents for atropine home installation? Uh, uh, um, uh, it uh, it will be applied for three times a day for three uh, once a day for three days. Okay. See, I don't ask dosage. Vas, look at that. What 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 it says here? Precautions and side effects. Uh, so, when pupil is dilated, so bright light. There is a problem in bright light for the child. So wear dark glasses or. Uh, Okay, what else? What kind of a, what kind of a pharmacological agent is uh, atropine? Ma'am, it is paracetamol. So what are all the anticholinergic side effects that you have? Myopia. No, ma'am, pyelocapin myopia is. What, the, what can the child manifest? If the child say, for example, parent says, I didn't get atropine ointment, I put atropine drops. Okay, what yes. type of side effects can happen if you just casually put atropine drops in the eye? Blurring of vision for near, ma'am. Okay, systemic side effects, doctor. I'm still waiting. Yeah, 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 ma'am. Systemic side effects are bad. Yeah. Fever and sure. bradycardia. Yes, ma'am. Bradycardia. No, ma'am. Yeah, tachycardia. Yeah. yeah, tachycardia, restlessness, flushing, fever. Yes, Absolutely. And how can you prevent this from happening if you put uh, somebody on atropine drops? How do you prevent this? So you do punctal occlusion. You tell the parents yes, punctual, occlusion. punctual occlusion after administering the drops. Okay. So let's see yes, how you did as well as uh, so dark iris, really dark iris dilate poorly. Okay. Also, children who children who have subluxation, epakia, they all dilate poorly, and uh, the rest of the answers was okay. Side effects, please brush up. So, when whenever you are asked side effects of a drug, you have to talk about both ocular and systemic. That is how you will divide your answer okay, to be systematic so that you don't forget uh, important side effects. Okay. So let's. Uh, who's next here? Amar, is Dr. Amar one of the candidates or am I calling an admin? I mean, one of the fellows. Dr. Amar? Yes, my mom. You ready? Yes. Okay. So read with the marks. Go ahead. Can you do something to make the quality of your better? Hello? Yes. Audible, Much better. 
I'm sorry. I'm having I'm having a lot of network issues. I'm sitting on this. I'm really sorry. Uh, the question is, what is the diagnosis? One mark. What are the clinical features? To I think he, we will let him fix his internet issue. So I request uh, Dr. Tanvi. Can you come on, Dr. Tanvi? Is, is there a Dr. Tanvi? Uh, is, is there is Dr. Harika. Are you one of the participants, Dr. Harika? I uh, just want to know from Santosh uh, and others, uh, maybe Rashmin. Am I still audible? I don't know if I went offline or whether the others are having trouble. No, no, no. You are audible now. You know, I'm yeah. audible. Okay, thank I you. They have for the uh, just dropped off some of them or maybe they have okay. internet issues. Okay, Dr. Akshadeep. Let's have Dr. Akshadeep. Uh, uh, what is the diagnosis? One mark. What are the clinical features? Two marks. What are the clinical types? Two marks. What is the immigration? One mark. And how do you manage the patient for two marks? Lovely. So on the dial, it appears to be a case of pseudostabismus. The clinical features are wide nasal bridge and the epicanthal epicanthus uh, folds are there. As it uh, the uh, what are the clinical types? The clinical types are uh, epicanth. Aha. Tell me something, doctor. Is really is it is it inward deviation? Is, is strabismus is the one that is really hitting you in this you look at this patient because this is something called a spotter. You look at this and you should be able to say what is this patient. But if you don't, if it doesn't hit you, look at the features. What else do you see about this child? Epicanthus is one thing you said. What type of epicanthus is this? Um, it is type one. There are many, there are basically three types. Uh, three types. That, uh, that, that's not what I asked you. I asked you what type of epicanthus is this? What is this patient? Ma'am, this is a patient of uh, epicanthus uh, inverse. Inverse? Does should immediately ring a bell. Which type of the epicanthus inverse is associated with what? What important syndrome? Uh, Ma'am, it is blepharophimosis epicanthus syndrome. Wonderful, wonderful doctor. That is why I am, I am re insisting again and again to read all the questions because if it is just an inward deviation strabismus, nobody is going to ask you what is the mutation. The very, uh, the, the very reason that there is some uh, mention there, the mutation, your alarm bells should go off that you're not dealing with run-of-the-mill esotropia. Okay? So pause right there and say, oh my God, is this something else? before you dig yourself into a hole. So this is diagnosis is blepharophimosis, lovely, uh, uh, blepharophimosis syndrome. What are the clinical features? Ma'am, uh, it has epicanthus, pelicanthus, and... Uh... Yeah. What are the clinical types? Ma'am, they are basically of three, uh, it has three types. Uh, and one which is uh, associated with the uh, epicanthus, telecanthus, and uh... okay. If you're not very sure, move on. Yes, ma'am. So, and this uh, is something to also remember in the exam that don't, if you really are not sure, but for example, you may not know of, of clinical types, you may not remember the mutation, but remember it's only one mark. So, don't uh, just stop there and stare, uh, you know, at nothing and worry. Go straight to the management. At least management, you may it may ring a bell. So go ahead and say what are the management. Uh, Ma'am, it is a, it can be of uh, two uh, epican. Uh, it can be of two types basically, medial and anterior. So in cases of where there uh, there can we can do uh, we can go for transnasal wiring basically. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. in cases of uh, Ma'am uh, the I are uh, going to pass a needle through the silicon uh, needle. And we are going to pass through the other epicanth, uh, through the medial canthus of the other end. And when in the same manner, we are going to rotate back to the 
uh, other eye uh, middle cancers and then we are going to tighten the silicon sleeve so that there is a reduction in the uh, epic, uh, telecancers what else does this patient need uh, sorry ma'am what else does this patient need what is happening particularly in the left eye ma'am there is ptosis absolutely so, so in your answer should have a list of first of what all this patient will need so it should say number 1 ptosis surgery number 2 transnasal wiring number 3 i don't know refractive error correction and treatment of amblyopia in the left eye whatever it needs to first have the list so you have got the list is there and then you can write details about how, how exactly you will do transnasal wire okay because that is time it's everything is time bound remember so write the list first and then write the details uh, as a general rule okay but well answered yeah. so here um try to write the full thing as i said try not to write short forms blepharophimo even though i have written don't write this blepharophimo is epicon epicanthus inversus ptosis telecanthus okay, there are two types and type 1 also has ovarian insufficiency with early menopause in foxl2 mutation on 3 uh, 2 3 is the it is the mutation and early ptosis surgery depending um, on uh, presence of amblyopia so this i mean the uh, deprivation amblyopia and cancer repair as as you correctly said transnasal wiring so that was lovely very well answered and um, so i am going to one last round still ask for anybody else is still there harika harika is one of the candidates is harika here so she's harika. not a candidate she's a fellow admin is it she's a, yeah, a fellow she's Yeah, she can answer, but uh, she's a RPC topper. So. Oh, she's a she's a doc. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Kuldeep Kumar? Kuldeep is an admin. Kuldeep is an admin. Okay. I think it says doctor. Mitika <laughs> did not come forward when I called earlier. I think Doctor Ankita is your fellow. Is she your fellow? Why did you answer? Yes. <laughs> yeah, Ankita will answer. Yeah, go ahead. Ankita will answer. Lovely. Okay. So read read the slide and questions and try and answer. Yep, go ahead, Ankita. Ankita. I think just four of us are left. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Let me go back to if Ankita is a little reluctant to answer. Let me go back to Doctor uh, Muskan. Doctor Muskan, uh, what surgery is being depicted? Uh, two marks. Uh, what is the indication for this procedure? Two marks. Uh, what is the action of the muscle that is being operated upon? Uh, what are the complications? Two marks. Lovely. So what do you, when you look at this, can you at one glance say which muscle are we talking about? What superior oblique muscle. Uh, superior oblique muscle is being acted uh, like uh, we are uh, doing surgery on superior oblique muscle. The actions Very of good. this muscle, the actions of this muscle is uh, it causes entorsion as a primary action, and uh, uh, it causes depression and abduction. Very good. Uh, But and uh, you see, the question is not what muscle is being at, at, uh, operated upon. The question is what surgery is being depicted. So, uh, but what you did is absolutely right. You went quickly to that part of the question that you knew the answer surely. Lovely. That's the way to approach. Now, if you look at all these little pictures here, is there an instrument there that tells you, "Ha, this is the surgery that's going on"? Are you able to say? Look at mm. D and E. Is there an instrument there that can tell you? So it's a good idea to look at atlases uh, before the exam to familiarize you yourself with these. Because cataracts, you all know really well. Pterygiums, you know well. Keratoplasty, you know well. But these are a little tricky surgeries. So you know, it's a good idea to look at uh, you know pictorial atlases. Can uh, you tell? Um, the, I don't know. I don't know about the instrument, but it looks as if SO tucking is being done. That superior oblique. Absolutely, it's a superior oblique tuck. Very well answered. And uh, what is the indication for this procedure? 
the indication is superior oblique palsy we um, according to naps classification we see uh, the diplopia is maximum if it is maximum like for a right superior oblique if it is maximum levo depression then we do uh, so tuck in that case otherwise inferior oblique weakening is the another procedure that we do you can also you can say that as you can say there is a if, if there is a lax superior oblique tendon what are the complications um, you tighten the superior oblique too much which means you pull the eye down then what will happen the eye will not go up in adduction and that will lead to what syndrome and which syndrome know, in which syndrome you know the answer in which syndrome the eye in adduction adduction doesn't go up uh, brown syndrome it will be a iatrogenic uh, brown syndrome induced that is type 7 you know the answer you know the answer so ne never think in your exam that you don't know you always know the answer it's just there somewhere you just need to find out where it is located and pull it out in a timely manner so this just to complete this particular uh, instrument is called a tendon tucker okay no no fancy names but it's a tendon tucker So you were right about all the um, indications and um, you know the complications. Lovely. So um, I'm just going to uh, Santosh look at the time very quickly. We we are eight eleven, so we may have time for another uh, uh, two or uh, uh, two questions, and then I'd like to share two videos because you can have videos also coming as uh, um, you, you know as questions in an OSCE. So let's do a couple of more OSCEs, and so. Let me ask uh, Shubhendra. Your first. This is an easy first. Your question. Let's have you answer this one. Yeah. Go ahead and read it out. What is shown here? Or one mark? What is the diagnosis in this patient for two marks? What equipment do you need for this test? Two marks. How else can you measure such patients? Three marks. Hmm. Yes. Um. Prism. What is the diagnosis uh, here? Uh, um, left eye. Ah, uh, see, ma'am. Left eye. Later rectus is start uh, working. No, no, no. You can't talk about uh, any uh, muscle unless you do eye movements. There okay, is only one photograph, and if you, if I remember, I told you which eye is the is the light centered. Uh, right eye uh, weak is orthophoric. Left eye. Uh -huh. Wait, wait, wait. Then just answer my question. Which eye is the right center? Uh, right eye. Right That's eye. It. So right eye, the pupil, the light is centered. Where is the left eye? Uh, left eye. It is not in the center. It is uh, adducted. No. It is inward deviated. Inwardly yes, deviated. Don't even use fancy terms. Inwardly deviated. Inwardly so deviated. Not, yeah. And I think is inwardly deviated is called what? What is the official term for it? E Esotropia. Fantastic! You're doing great. I think you have a future as a strabismologist. It is left mm -hmm. esotropia. That's it. That is the diagnosis. Okay. But yes, for some reason, they have put a prism in front of the right eye now. Yes, ma'am. For degree of uh, to uh, degree of the test, degree of the angle. Yes, but what is this test called? Prism is uh... right. If you use the prism, the the test is not called prism. What is it called? You you know you you don't know. So I I won't. Uh, I'm not going to keep bugging you about this. Uh, let me ask if uh, Dr. Webhub knows. Dr. Webhub, do you know what this test is called? Uh, Ma'am, this is the prism uh, prism bar prism cover test. Uh, it is the cover. I don't see any cover. The prism is in front of the fixing eye. Okay, okay. This is a uh, ma'am. Pardon? Uh, this is a crimp, modified crimp. Fantastic! It's called a modified crimp this test. And so, what do you really need for this? Ah, uh, uh, ma'am, because basically this is done in patients who have poor vision in one eye. Ah, uh, so we cannot you uh, do a alternate cover test. So we actually put the prism over the sound eye so that uh, the non fixing eye uh, rotates and according to the reflex and we measure the amount of deviation doctor you have excelled today this is an this is fantastic this is an excellent answer i mean it and it really very good 
Let's look at the answer. So how else can you measure these patients? By Hirschberg. Mm -hmm. All right. But you, and you can do a Krimsky where you put the, the, the uh, prism in the deviating eye, in front of the deviating eye. So what you would need is loose prism, prism bar, and the torch light. Okay. So remember, you have to pay attention to the marks and uh, what is shown here, even if you don't remember what is shown here, if you can say that the left eye is inward, write that as the diagnosis, that has two marks, okay? So go ahead and write that quickly. So that is how you must pace yourself. You might have forgotten the, the, the term modified Krinsky. That's okay, it will come back to you. Meanwhile, try and answer the others because again, this is time bound, okay? And let's do one more question before we go to the surgery. This is not such a fun question. Okay, let's do a fun, this uh, Dr. Grover already covered. This I'm not gonna go when uh, Santosh is here. Okay, we'll go to one last one here. And for that, let's, I'm gonna ask Dr. Madhurya. Dr. Madhurya. Yes, ma'am. All right. So uh, the question is, on your routine IE exam, 10 year old found to have uh, right eye 66 vision and left eye 636 vision. And then describe for two marks. What history will you take for two marks? And what will be your focus during the clinical exam for two marks? And what could be the etiology? So, uh, for describe, uh, how, uh, for descri description, this looks like an uh, uh, exotropia of the left eye. Uh, and uh, uh, where uh, through Hersberg test, I can say that uh, it is around 30 to 40 uh, degrees. So for the history, which I will take is, I will take a history of the onset, whether it is an acute onset or uh, has it been present since childhood. So okay. if it is, so if it is present since childhood or whether it is an acute onset. And uh, um, uh, I would also like to uh, uh, take the history, whether this eye comes to focus sometimes or not. So according to the Newcastle school that you previously discussed, I will ask the parents uh, whether this eye Dr. comes Dr. to Dr. focus. Dr. Doctor, doctor, this is OSCE exam. No, no, I will this ask one. parents. This is not okay. table viva. I'm not quizzing okay. you on this patient who's come for a clinical exam. So you have to be very focused. So your answer okay. has to be one syllable, comma, so, one syllable, comma, one syllable. So okay. the history of onset, good. Second, intermittent or constant. That's yes, all you should do. The next, okay, next so point. my focus, my focus will be uh, the difference uh, between the near and the far, whether uh, uh, the exotropia is present in near or it is only present in far or whether it is intermittent in near or intermittent or uh, constant in far. And I would also uh, like to uh, measure the uh, uh, degrees of exotropia in near and far. far. And uh, what could be the etiology? It can be uh, intermittent exotropia or uh, ex uh, exotropia if... Uh, okay, let me tell you, let me give you a little clue, even though it's not here. And this is generally for strabismus, any strabismus. We don't have a nine days photo. We only have we only have one particular photograph, right? Just one single photograph of primary gaze showing the left eye is exotropic. Now, yes, what for all exotropias, you always have to make sure that this is not sensory, okay? Yes. And this is not a secondary exotropia due to any consecutive deviation, like a third nerve palsy. Third nerve even, palsy. Though, even though a, third, a classic third nerve will be down and out no, and no. ptosis and all this masala. You, but any exotropic eye, you have to wonder if it's third nerve palsy. So your answer should reflect that you have thought of sensory topics, that you've looked at cataract, you've looked at the posterior pole for a, a scar, uh, that is uh, media opacities, et cetera, et cetera. That is, it needs to be very, all the other things you answered were absolutely fine, but uh, you must talk about left exotropia, divergent squint, history of laws of vision. Like I said, this could be a trauma. Child could have had a tr blunt trauma and then, uh, you know, the eye abandoned surgery and now it's exotropic because there's no vision in that eye, correct? So history of loss of vision, trauma, diplopia, head trauma for third nerve. You have to examine clear media control of deviation, which we use said correctly. You have to look at the refraction because you may want to manage the patient, funders exam. And you correctly said it could be a decompensated IDS, sensory exotropia, third cranial nerve. 
always think of sensory, always think of incompetent deviations that are presented like this, and then only think of a competent uh, yes, deviation as, as your uh, answer. Okay. So okay, I think I'll just uh, I'll just quickly uh, without asking. Um, let me just uh, speak to Santosh. Santosh, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up with uh, one, maybe two videos. I hope that is okay. Um, Santosh, is that yeah. okay? Yeah. All right. I'm just going to quickly go through what other types of scenarios I, I have just put together. So um, uh, just for you to get an idea. So this is is um, this is you might get a subluxated lens. And questions along with subluxated lenses, you could get something about accommodative esotropia. You could have questions on optic nerve hypoplasia and the systemic associations. Down syndrome and ocular manifestations. So we could have a, a nine gaze photograph. This is a photograph of Duane's retraction syndrome. You could have instruments like this is a, a Jameson hook. And the questions are what are the hooks and what is the reason for the knob and things like that. This is atropin 0.01%. What is the indication? What are the studies that use this? What are the side effects type of questions? You could have, this is periventricular leukomalacia. And they could ask you what type of scan is this? What are your findings? What are the uh, situations, risk factors for this? This is a photograph of a superior bleak palsy. Uh, you can see, uh, and the questions may be, what are the findings? In which case you have to talk about Underaction, overaction, hypertropia, box three step test, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this, those are the kind of uh, questions. And so I'm going to go back to the to and see if I can uh, pull up the video. I'm going to just stop sharing here. Santosh, is it okay? Can I just put one video? Sure. On just a second, I'm just going to say share screen. Okay, is that visible? And this question is to Dr. I see who's left. Dr. Vineet, are you yes, there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So please watch this video. back to my PowerPoint. Share screen. So here's a question. What muscle is being operated upon? What is the nerve supply? What are the surgeries that can be done on this muscle? What are the complications? Ma'am, in that video... What's Pardon? Actually, actually uh, the video is, uh, was very fast. I, I just not get it, ma'am. Wow, I thought it was so long, unedited and boring. Anyway, it's just, it's just a matter of perspective, I guess. Okay, so um, this is just to tell you that you might get something like this in the exam. So what you, you want to watch out for is that, look, here they have just picked up a muscle 
that looks kind of thick. It, you can't see the cornea. It seems to be in some corner. So which muscle is in corner in the eye? You see the cornea is usually like this. Yeah, it could be a superior oblique. Or it could be inferior oblique, yes. Absolutely, because if it's a superior oblique, you're going to see a tendon. You will not see a thick muscle. You're not going to go and take a clamp and put it on the red looking muscle. So that gives you a clue that is inferior oblique. That's a two marks. If you say inferior oblique, you understand? So that's the difference. If you see the cornea, it's usually a rectus. If you don't see the cornea, then you know it's an oblique. And if you see it's all tenderness, if it's all aponeurotic, then it is superior oblique tendon. If, you, if it's just a thick wink muscle, then it is likely to be in the oblique. So two marks. So I've asked for nerve supply, which is again a piece of cake of answer, really. And what is the nerve supply, doctor? Third nerve, ma'am. Yeah, you have to say inferior division of the third nerve. You've got to be a little inferior. more specific. Yes. Yeah, what are the surgeries that can be done on this muscle? So there's your answer, myectomy, recession, denervation and extirpation and anterior transposition. And the uh, complications that you, could be fat and adherence and macular damage. Uh, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spare you and leave on a nice note uh, because the next surgery was actually going to be a fadan, which uh, would be also tough if you've never seen a fadan. But again, uh, I want to um, impress upon you a few things. That is, look at eye movement videos, Look at videos of how you do a post generation test, post duction test, diplopia charting, prison cover test videos, the video of how a DVD looks like, what ERGs look like. We have not covered all these things today. Please look at video clips of all squint surgeries. See, the important thing for you is you have to focus on what you may not have had exposure to in your program. Uh, look at congenital cataract surgery especially primary, primary posterior capsulotomy. I have not covered topics like congenital glaucoma, ptosis, and other pediatric plastic disorders. I've not covered pediatric VR disorders because really there are many, many, and hopefully they'll be covered in subsequent sessions by the respective specialities. So this is just given you an overview of what uh, to expect, what it could be like. And uh, I think you all actually answered really well. I was very impressed with the level of answering uh, and I hope the ones that have uh, shied away come back online uh, because your ophthalmology is meant even more fun. And I once again thank uh, Santosh and Rushman for this uh, kind invitation and the opportunity to kickstart this uh, really, really wonderful and timely and useful session uh, of OSCEs. And wish you all the very best uh, to all the candidates. Thank you so much, Meenakshi. It was wonderful. I think they're all slowly coming back, but they don't know what they're in for. Rashmin Gandhi next. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vinay. Rashmin is a neuro-ophthalmologist and the most famous one at that. And he's going to quiz us on neuro-ophthalmology. And that's very important for the exams, by the way. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Unfortunately, just as we were starting, uh, the, the Wi-Fi has gone away, so I'm actually presenting my, from the phone. Fortunately, I have a few slides which I have on the phone, so hopefully we'll be able to do well. And meanwhile, let's see if the, the Wi-Fi comes back. Let me share my screen here. All right, so hopefully you are able to see the screen now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, Minakshi did a great job of uh, saying, uh, you know, how do you approach an OSCE? So we had Dr. Grover telling us about uh, the pattern of the OSCE, the history about the OSCE, and then Minakshi gave you that one hour uh, introduction of how do you approach OSCE? If you see, uh, if you are in a OSCE situation, table, slide, video, how do you make sure that uh, you read the questions properly, all the questions, make sure that the weightage, you look at the weightage, you also can get the hint. Even if you didn't understand what the video or a photograph is all about, you might still get the hint from uh, the questions and that's how you approach. So my job is very easy. I'm just trying to 
give you some scenarios which are very commonly asked in Austrian Royal College or in DNB in your ophthalmology. And my job here is to give you a few common questions in each scenario, number one, and number two, to test how quickly you are able to recollect uh, the information that is required for your OSCE. So these are the scenarios which are by and large you'll expect in neuro-ophthalmology. It would be a photograph of an optic disc and in uh, neuro-ophthalmology it would probably be a disc edema or a pale disc. You can also have a video or a photograph of pupil and we'll talk about it. Six no palsy, third no palsy, ocular myosin gravis, myopathies. The rare ones which can still be asked and have been asked are PSP, INO, or uh, nystagmus. And in investigation, the commonly asked investigation with the neuroophthalmology focus would be visual fields, uh, neuroimaging, commonly MRI, but you can have CT scan as well, and electrodiagnostics, mainly VEP. So now uh, let me ask uh, the survivors who are here. Let me start with Vineet, if he's here. Uh, if yeah. I show you a photograph of disc edema, and we are just revising uh, these topics first, and then we are going to the, the OSCE. So if I show you a photograph of disc edema without giving you any history, uh, yes. what thoughts cross your mind? What all would you think of you say, if you just see a, a photograph of a disc edema? So it's unilateral or bilateral, sir? Very good, unilateral, fantastic. That's a good question to ask. Uh, unilateral, so it, uh, it may be a optic neuritis, sir. Yes. Or uh, AION. Very good, fantastic. Uh, sir, uh, and bilateral papilloedema, sir. First thing come. First, first thing is papilloedema. Papilloedema. Anything else? Yes. Intracranial hypertension. Huh. So, uh, first, so that's papilloedema, and then what causes papilloedema is where you'll say that it's raised intracranial pressure and whatnot. Very good. Anything else? Which great for fantastic. Yes, CRVO. Fantastic. CRVO man. Fantastic. Too. Fantastic. Fantastic. So CRVO, very unlikely that will be bilateral. We're talking about bilateral disc edema. So if you see a disc edema, you already, if it's lateral, you first you ask yourself, is it unilateral, whether you've been shown both eyes or one eye. If it's a unilateral disc edema, you already know that probably you're dealing with uh, optic neuritis, non-arthritic anti-ischemic optic neuropathy, or arthritic anti-ischemic optic neuropathy. And a immediate clue to the answer would be look at the age. If you are shown a picture with a disc edema in a young person who is complaining of pain and loss of vision, you are probably dealing with inflammation of the optic nerve. If the photograph is of uh, somebody who is between 40 to 60 with loss of vision without pain and a disc edema, you are probably dealing with uh, non-arthritic anti ischemic optic neuropathy. If you are shown a picture of somebody who is elderly, about 65, 70, uh, you are looking at uh, arthritic uh, variety of anti-ischemic optic neuropathy. So that's disc edema. Very good. What about pale disc? What about pale disc? Optic atrophy. Yes. So what in optic atrophy? Mm. Like so, isn't it? Can you hear me? So now you are audible, sir. Yes, sir. All right, all right. So optic atrophy is generally uh, a sign, but what if you see an optic atrophy? What what thoughts cross your mind? Obviously, you would like to know what would have caused. Cause, yes, sir. Yeah, yes. and what what generally you are looking at? Time. Sir, optic atrophy could be primary, secondary, yes, or it could be uh, secondary to glaucoma or or consecutive. Fantastic. So what we want to uh, look at is, is this optic energy 
because of previous swelling of the optic nerve. Uh, so since you are logged in from both the devices, the voice is echoing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. You are audible. Yeah. So in optic atrophy, you would like to know what has caused optic atrophy, all right? So when if you see a dyskinema, you already have unilateral neuritis, non-arthritic, arthritic, bilateral papilledema, hypertensive retinopathy, and questions will give you a clue. These are the commonest variety. What about pupil? If you see a patient with anisocoria. Is that that is it is physiological anisocoria or pathological anisocoria? So in OSCE, physiological is very unlikely to be asked. You will have a pathological anisocoria. So what thoughts cross your mind? If you are so Whether an anisocoria is more in dark or more in light. Yes. Like if so, the anisocoria increases in dark, then we will think of sympathetic pathology. And if an anisocoria increases in uh, bright light, right. then we think of parasympathetic or AD stonic pupil. Right. So... If you are shown an isocoria, you already know that you are probably dealing with Horner's syndrome or Eddie's pupil because third nerve palsy, you will have everything else being given there. So you are automatically narrowing down what you might be dealing with. And then you look at the question, you know that you have a clue about it. Six nerve palsy, what, what all would you think of if you are shown a, a picture or a video of six nerve palsy? The deviation of eye exo. Yes, so you'll, you'll see a limitation of abduction, which abduction. that's how you will come to conclusion. Okay, that is systemic of complaints of the patient and fundus findings. These are the two most important things we'll look for in a six nerve pulse. So basically, you'll be looking at three things. In an elderly uh, gentleman, generally, you would be asked whether is it because of diabetes or hypertension. So a lot of times you'll be asked, what next would you do? So don't immediately jump to say that hypertension, sugar, or MRI. First, you say, is it isolated or is it polyneuropathy? You'll check corneal sensation. You'll look at the seventh nerve. You look at the cerebellar function. All these are normal is where you say this is an isolated sixth nerve palsy. Elderly gentlemen, hypertension, diabetes. Younger gentlemen or younger person, most likely to be space of pang lesion. This is something which you should be sure. Third nerve, what is the most important Thing that you look at if you are shown a third nerve video? Pupil involvement present or not? You, you the pupillary pupil. involvement. Fantastic. Direct. Fantastic. And generally third nerve palsy would Down be and out, I think. very clear to you. You will not have a confusion in diagnosis. So it's the, the question and we are going to discuss it in OSCE. What about oculomyasthenia gravis? Age, uh, systemic uh, uh, myasthenia present or not? Tosis will be dynal variation that is important no so uh, what would be asked generally the reason we are going through this is what questions might be asked so if i say oculomycina gravis what two or three things which you are remembering immediately one is dynal variation any clinical sign earlier sign sir Lit twitching. Fogan to his sign, sir. Fogan to his sign. Petigability. Petigability. And then what? Yes, and what kind of uh, test generally you will be doing in the OPD? Ice pack Ice test. Pack test Very good. So this is what generally these are the things that you will be asked. Myopathy. When would you suspect somebody as having myopathy? See, all this you will not have moment, problem diagnosis. The so pain on ocular, ocular movement. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Faces, pain, sir. Uh, faces, the, sir. On the face, uh, patient faces will be... Face, face will be... Uh, face will be uh, there will be no emotionless face. Then it will be bilateral. Be bilateral. You see a... One minute. Let me just uh, get this phone out. It will be bilaterally symmetrical, generally uh, ptosis, and the ocular motility would be symmetrically affected in both the eyes. That's where you suspect myopathy. In myopathy, if you're looking at a younger female, most probable diagnosis is CPEO. If you're looking at an older person, probable diagnosis, diagnosis is myotonic dystrophy. These are the two common myopathies which will be asked in your OSCE. 
PSP ion and nystagmus, these are uncommon, but if they are asked, then you can score there because there is no confusion in the diagnosis. What is PSP? Progressive supranuclear palsy. Very good. And a question which is often asked in OSCE is, why you need to differentiate PSP from Parkinson's? Sir, so can you repeat the question? Why, why it is important for you to differentiate PSP from Parkinson's? Both have very similar pictures. The reason why it is important to differentiate between the two is PSP, once the patient has Parkinson-like feature but starts developing gaze palsy, and once the vertical gaze and horizontal gaze goes, there is a very high chances of mortality within six months. So that's the reason why PSP, you need to differentiate. That's why it is often asked because your diagnosis would make a difference to what prognosis you're giving to the patient. Parkinsonism, patient will survive. It's just that he'll have other disabilities. PSP, uh, there is a high chance of mortality because of degeneration in the brain. What is INO? The internuclear, internuclear. thermoplasia. Yeah, so what how do you diagnose? Because these are things where you may not be able to diagnose unless you know about it. How would you diagnose? There is ipsilateral, uh, ipsilateral adduction Medial deficit and contralateral ataxic nystagmus in uh, uh, abduction. Beautiful. MLF nucleus series damage. Right. So what is important here, what the question will be asked is which side? One, where is the lesion? Which side the lesion? So lesion is given to the side of adducting eye. So eye which is not adducting, you say it is if right eye is not adducting, left eye is an astagmus, you call it right internuclear ophthalmoplegia. MLF is generally a lesion, site of lesion. What is the common causes of MLF lesion? Sclerosis, multiple sclerosis. Yes, in a younger patient, multiple sclerosis, older patient, infarct, right? In multiple sclerosis, what kind of INO is more common? What kind of I? What type? You know, there are different types or... Babino syndrome. Babino syndrome. Babino. Generally bilateral. Babino. In multiple sclerosis, you will find bilateral INO. That is much more common. Yes. The, visual fields, uh, the trick, you see, when you're given a visual field, you don't know whether it's a glaucoma field or a neuroophthalm field. So the trick would be, one, if both fields are given together, it's much more likely to be a neurological field than a glaucoma field. Because you, are, you need to look at it. And of course, when you look of at the course, question, you don't know which one we are talking about. MRI, VI, uh, that's something which you need something to read up because uh, generally we don't deal with them regularly. With that background, let's look at some of the OSCE questions. So in neuroophthalmology, you would have to have history because unless the history is given, you will not uh, have the diagnosis so often clearly. So if you're given a clinical history that is a young female, history of ocular pain, monocular vision loss three weeks ago, improvement in vision in the last one week, and optic discs are normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? Weibo? Uh, so optic neuritis, uh, because she's a young female and the vision has recovered and the disc doesn't have any hemorrhages. Fantastic. Now, what type of neuroimaging would you request? Uh, Ma'am, so, so, uh, an MRI I would like to do and more of I would like to do a gadolinium contrast uh, MRI to look for any brain lesions. So, uh, Akshaydeep, would you like to complete the answer? He says MRI brain with contrast. Would you like to complete the answer? Um. Vinit? So you're absolutely right, Vaiba. You will ask for will MRI ask brain for MRI and orbit. Bit. So you have to ask for orbit. MRI brain, MRI brain orbit with, with contrast, contrast with fat suppression. Fat. So you find the hyper intensity signal on the MRI. So here they might ask you what type of MRI in neuroimaging one one mark. What do you find what you're looking for in neuroimaging? Akshadip, what you're looking for in MRI? So, so you are not audible. What are you looking for in MRI scan? Vaibhav said that he, he would like to ask for MRI. What are you looking for? Sir, there will be periventricular plaques basically in MRI. Okay. 
Okay. And, uh, okay. Yes. Anything else? You also optic find optic nerve enhancement. Yes, optic nerve enhancement. Absolutely, you may also find hyper intense okay. lesion along the optic nerve, which is better seen on T two. So there are two things you're looking for in MRI in a case of optic neuritis. One is hyper intensity along the optic nerve, and second is periventricular plaques. They are also called what? Harsh. Dawson fingers. Dawson fingers. Absolutely. Now. What is the treatment? Madhurya? So, uh, we'll start with the uh, intravenous methylprednisolone, uh, one, uh, one uh, gram per kg body weight, uh, one milligram per kg body weight for no. 11 days, and then we'll uh, start no. on oral prednisolone. No, Harsh, would you like to correct him? Uh, we'll start with. Uh, IVMP one gram daily for eleven days, followed by oral uh, prednisolone acetate for uh, one mg per day for uh, another uh, three days. No, no, no. So it's other way round. Uh, just, uh, just the opposite. Eleven days oral, followed by oral. Okay. Now here you might be asked some caveats about ONTT that you should not be starting oral steroids alone. Starting oral steroids alone may lead to increased recurrence. So they, you might, these facts can be twisted and asked as a question. You are giving one gram per day for three days, IV, followed by oral. Oral alone is should not be given because it will increase the recurrence. And what neurological association do we expect in about 50% of these patients? In optic neuritis? Multiple sclerosis. Multiple, Multiple sclerosis. sclerosis. Nowadays, or uh, harsh what else you are looking for in Indian situation? Last few years, we have a lot of cases of these. Apart from multiple sclerosis. Devic's disease. Neuromyelitis optica, Devic's disease. Devic's disease. Uh, Fantastic. Very good. Very good, Muskan. So what, how do you confirm, Muskan, the presence of NMO? It's called NMO, Neuromyelitis optica. Older name, Devic's disease. Uh -huh. Uh, so in that the spinal cord is uh, also involved. So uh, we, there is transverse myelitis and bilateral optic neuritis in that case. So yes. if the patient comes to us with bilateral optic neuritis, then we should suspect NMO and we can order for an MRI involving the spinal cord. So if there is three or more segments involved, that is longitudinal ex extensive transverse myelitis, then uh, we can think of NMO. And uh, also there are antibodies to aquaporin uh, for uh, NMO antibodies. So we uh, order for anti-MOG and anti-NMO. Very good. Uh, very in these good. So you, you, you did not have this much detail in OSCE. But why I'm asking all this is because some of these might come up and you should have that recall because the time is short. You have only three to five minutes. You should be able to recall. All right. Why about this is for you. Forty-six year old female, painless loss of vision, vision six by twenty-four. Uh, Forty-six year old. Did you see the photograph, Weber? Uh, yes, sir. Uh... Okay. So go on, apply, Doctor Ms. Uh, some um, mostly uh, the the vision loss occurs in um, after waking up, sir, and the pathophysiology behind. So I, was I audible, sir? Uh, now, there now was actually now you are. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, some most uh, most commonly the patient uh, patient complains of loss of vision on waking up. And uh, this is because of the nocturnal hypertension, which occurs uh, generally. And uh, and uh, the disc in the normal eye is likely to be crowded. Uh, and this we have to, so if there is a high-risk high, high disc, then we have to uh, find that. And typical field defect will be an altitudinal uh, defect we'll see. Um, and horizontal meridian, obeying the horizontal meridian. And uh, so the three associations may be, so the patient may be having hyperlipidemia or uh, uh, 
uh, hypertension, diabetes, or maybe drug toxicity because of uh, amiodarone or interferon alpha. Anything else in a younger patient? Uh, Hyperhomocysteinemia. Hyperhomocysteinemia. So All right. Below 40, you have to look for homocysteine level. And the other association which is coming up now is sleep apnea. See. All right. Akshay Dip. Yes, sir. You have 20 seconds to look at this photograph. All right. I'm going to give you the history. This is a disc photograph of 26 year old female. She complains of headaches. Go back and see this. 26 year old female with complaints of headaches. Go ahead. So the uh, it's, uh, three likely symptoms uh, there will be headache and associated with the headache uh, she will always be having also uh, in systemically nausea vomiting will be associated with the headache severe headache and uh, so there will be uh... all right we will come back to that field effect in acute and chronic condition uh, there will be uh, so, uh, the picture basically shows the idiopathic, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So, um, okay, neuroimaging of choice. Uh, so, it's an MRI should be done. Okay, Muskan, take all the questions. I uh, said so this is a case of uh, benign idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The three likely symptoms would be nausea, projectile vomiting, uh, and headaches, uh, and uh, mild blurring of vision, and field effects uh, in acute and chronic condition. Uh, enlargement of blind spot is there is a, uh, characteristically seen in, uh, in in any papilledema case. And uh, neuroimaging of choice would be uh, we'll do MR, uh, uh, we will uh, do MRI, sir, to look for uh, uh, like all right, just uh, all right, let me let and me, drug of choice would be yeah, let me give you the, the answer. See, three likely symptoms you can't have headache, nausea, vomiting. Headache, I've already told you, so nausea, vomiting uh, can't be counted as two symptoms, so with headache. The symptoms would be vomiting. Most important for us, and a lot of times we forget, is transient visual obscurations, which lasts for a few seconds. This is very, very important to ask. Generally, patients would describe it as browning out of vision. So transient visual obscuration with browning out of vision is an important symptom. And the third symptom we should always ask for is tinnitus. So apart from headache, vomiting, transient visual obscuration, and tinnitus. These are the three symptoms that you should be aware of. Field effect in an acute uh, papilledema. So this is papilledema. There is no such thing as benign intracranial hypertension. Please, that term has been given up. And that is a diagnosis of exclusion. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a diagnosis of exclusion. So what you have arrived at is this is papilledema because of raised ICP. Your field effect in acute papilledema would be enlarged blind spot. In a chronic papilledema, it will be ring scotoma or generalized constriction of visual field. Chronic papilledema visual field is one of the differentials of ring scotoma or a tunnel vision. Apart from uh, retinitis pigmentosa and glaucoma, chronic papilledema can also cause uh, tunnel vision or generalized constriction of visual field. Neuroimaging of choice, and all of you missed it, is apart from MRI, these patients would require most of the time MRV, MR venogram, because you want to rule out uh, thrombosis of venous sinuses. And drug of choice, of course, everybody will know, would be? What would be the drug of choice to treat? Estazolamide. Estazolamide, absolutely right. Very good. All right, let's go to somebody who has not answered. Uh, is Bhavika or Tanvi here? 
If they are not there, then any one of you can take up. This is about the investigation. Uh, they are not there, sir. I think anybody else can take up. Yeah. Uh, Vaibhav, would you like? This to is. Uh, Nikita, you can also take up. What is this investigation? A T two weighted, which is not that suppressed. Okay. What MRI? Sensor, yeah. Axial coronal sagittal. <clears throat> Axial, sir. Very good. What's your diagnosis? Optic nerve sheet meningioma, maybe. Uh, okay. Wanted to look at something here. I, I know what why you're saying it because this now probably looks a little thickened, but that's not. What do you see? Pituitary macro adenoma. Yeah. So basically, what you have is a chiasmal compression, a tumor Chias. compressing on the chiasma. Right. What is the likely field effect? Bitemporal. Bitemporal amenopia. Amenopia. Good. What are the other field effects that you may see apart from bitemporal amenopia? So you can see uh, quadrant locus is superior, superior uh, bitemporal quadrant locus. Okay, so it may not be a complete bitemporal hemianopia. You can probably have a defect which starts either superiorly or inferiorly, and in this case, it will start superiorly. Very good. Anything else? Uh, Junctional scotoma, sir. Fantastic. Please always remember that probable field effects when you have a chiasmal compression. Most important and most common is bitemporal hemianopia. It can be incomplete bitemporal hemianopia as well, or patient can have junctional scotoma. So if, you're, if the fields are given, you'll find that there is a central defect in one eye and a suprotemporal defect, which is respecting a vertical midline in the other eye. Likely optic disc feature? Temporal uh, okay. pallor, sir. No. I mean, temporal pallor can be seen, but more Band shape. Absolutely. Motai optic atrophy is one of the features of somebody who has chiasmal compression. What kind of nystagmus you can see in these patients? Seesaw nystagmus. Seesaw nystagmus. Seesaw nystagmus. Absolutely right. <clears throat> okay, Vinit. Yes, sir. The visual fields are for you. Uh, Complete description of this visual field effect. That these visual field effect shows uh, homonymous uh, quadrant opia, sir. Uh, most probably craniopharyngeum. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> First, the description. Please remember, homonymous. In homonymous. You will have yes. heteronymous. One here and one here. Okay. But yes. here it is nasal, here it is temporal. In craniopharyngeum, it will be both temporal. Yes. So now, would you like to revise and describe this as? Vaibhav, what is this visual field effect? Sir, uh, heteronymous uh, quadrant anopia, pi in the floor. Uh... Yeah, so this is homonymous. Yes. Homonymous hemianopia, pi in the floor, sir. Yeah. So this is? Temporal lobes, sir. That description. Tem the description. Right the loop. Left one. Ah, Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. That is temporal loop. No, it's not, it's not temporal. First, the description. Left inferior homonymous quadrantonopia. So it is left sided. That all of you forgot. It's a left sided inferior homonymous quadrantonopia. Where is the lesion now? Where would you localize the lesion? In the superior quadrants, sir. Uh, no, no, no. The parietal lobe, sir. Parietal lobe. Sorry, sorry, sir. Right. Right parietal lobe. Right parietal lobe. Right, right parietal lobe. Right yes, parietal. What's the commonest cause of uh, this kind of visual field effect in a 65 year old male? It will be infarction of the right parieto or right parieto occipital lobe. Now, this is a, a, a bonus question or a trick question or a question which will give you marks. This is the a question where you can score marks. And generally, I will give you two marks to this is what are the other or what is at least one other neuroophthalmic feature? Uh, Asymmetric okay answer. Fantastic. And why would you see why would you see asymmetric okay? 
what is the cause Usually, uh, due to parietal lobe infarct, we'll see uh, asymmetric or okay, and uh, uh, if it is uh, if it is occipital lobe involvement, then we'll see uh, symmetric okay, and it is most commonly due to tumor. Due to uh, it is Coogan's dictum. So, smooth pursuit is actually controlled by the parietal lobe. So, when the smooth pursuit is disrupted because of lesion of parietal lobe, we will have a uh, asymmetrical lobe. Excellent. Both of you gave fantastic answers and. Please remember here, only one uh, thing to uh, add in your answer, Vaibhav, mm -hmm. is that smooth pursuit to the same side. Right parietal lobe will control smooth pursuit to the right side. Fantastic. Beautiful. All right. Muskan, would you like to take this? Uh, yes, sir. So in this, uh, uh, there is uh, an isochoria. Uh, yeah, we can see the left, left eye is, uh, pupil is, very good. Uh, Very good. Left eye pupil was uh, larger than the right eye. Fantastic. So these are the questions. You, you said, what is a pupillary condition? You said anisocoria. What if the condition was worse in a dark room? Uh, so then it would be a sympathetic uh, system uh, being affected, uh, most likely Horner syndrome. And the Why? other features... Always, always in neuro-ophthalmology, Take the side because you would be a lot of features would depending upon which side of the brain is affected. So it'll be right Horner syndrome. Because right pupil was smaller. Yes, sir. All right. Other and, features uh, in the eye? Uh, other features in Horner's are meiosis, uh, like we say uh, there is anhydrosis, ptosis, uh, loss of senior spinal reflex, and N of thalamus, which is usually associated with it. Uh, but Anything else? So these Vibha, are the... Vibha, one more eye feature. So, enophthalmos. She said that. Uh, so serious Leg of thalmos. No, not leg of thalmos. Patient will have actually ptosis. Patient will have small mind ptosis, what she said as well. Enophthalmos is because of ptosis of upper eyelid, molars muscle, and inferior capsular bulbar fascia also go to And that's why there is an inferior ptosis as well. The other feature would be because there is no sympathetic system, the pupillary constriction in that eye would be very fast because it's only parasympathetic system. If you throw a light on a harness pupil, there'll be fast constriction. Please remember loss of ciliospinal reflex and anhydrosis. Generally, you don't see those things in your as an ophthalmologist in our day-to-day -day life. So ptosis, inferior ptosis, relative enophthalmus, and fast constriction of pupil. Then, of course, anhydrosis and loss of ciliospinal spinal reflex to complete the list. Most important, uh, Vaibha, uh, no, Muskan. This patient had a fall three days ago, complains, and he complains of headache and neck pain. What is the most appropriate thing to imagine? Usually, the painful horners is caused by carotid dissection. Uh, so, we will do carotid uh, Doppler or... Uh, I exactly don't know the neuroimaging, but carotid dissection we have to look for. Fantastic. So basically, it's not that all painful Horner syndromes are because of dissection of larger vessels. Painful fracture, so CT scan would be. No. Uh, so here, what we are looking at is uh, please remember painful Horner syndrome, you have to ask where the pain is. Horner syndrome with headache, it can be because of trigeminal system. Horner syndrome with only neck pain. And not all painful Horner syndrome with neck pain would have dissection of larger vessels. You need to have a history of trauma and a severe trauma in a younger patient. And a painful Horner's with a pain in a clavicle region would be pancos tumor. So in this patient, because patient complained of neck pain and had a fall three days ago, the most appropriate neuroimaging would be MRI with MRA of the neck vessels, because that's where you are looking at for a dissection of larger vessels. Okay, so this is uh, probably a last or a second last question. Look at this video. Akshaydeep, yours.
this is the situation where uh, questions would guide you. If you look, if you look at the question, you know that what you're dealing with. Anybody else? Harsh? Pseudo one graph a sign, sir. Fantastic. Well done. So it is a pseudo one graph a sign because there was uh, that that is seen in which condition? Aberrant, Aberrant regeneration of third. Name the other two signs. So on adduction, there will be meiosis of uh, the pupil of the affected eye. And uh, also on adducting, the, uh, there may be uh, downward, uh, the inferior rectus also may be uh, aberrant degeneration. So the patient will have a downward deviation on adducting, uh, asking the patient to adduct. All right. It, patient can also have widening of the palpable fissure when uh, the, that eye is adducted. That's called inverse duance. Inverse duance will be narrowing. Here they'll be widening. And the constriction of the pupil is also called pseudo ARP or also called Zernecki's sign. Now, why this aberrant regeneration important in a clinical practice? Uh, so while operating, we can use this aberrant regeneration to treat the patient. Uh, uh, before that. The compressive, uh, compressive lesions uh, are associated with aberrant regeneration and the ischemic conditions are not associated with it. So uh, it is an important sign that we have to rule out some compressive lesion and do neuroimaging. Fantastic. If the neuroimaging has not been done in a third no palsy and patient develops an aberrant regeneration, this is a sign which will tell you that patient should undergo neuroimaging. What kind of neuroimaging? MRI. Very good. MRI with MRI. This is the last uh, slide, last video. All right, so this is straightforward. Diagnosis? Complete, complete, third, complete third nerve palsy, sir. Right side. Always mention the side. Right, right side. What investigation would you order if pupil is involved? We just mentioned that. MRI plus MRI plus MRI. Yes. And what are you looking for in MRI? Uh, ischemic so looking for involvement of uh, posterior communicating artery aneurysm. So whether it is surgical lesion or a medical lesion. Yes, so what you're looking for is aneurysm of posterior communicating artery. And that's why you are advising MR angiogram mm -hmm. as well. And what are two conditions which will compel you to order investigation even if pupil is not involved? So involvement of other cranial nerves. Yes. And uh, if the uh, third nerve is not recovering after six months, then we'll also order the Fantastic. If the third nerve has not recovered, if there are other nerves, if aberrant regeneration occurs when the third nerve recovers or when the patient presents to you with an incomplete third nerve palsy, then you should do neuroimaging because rule of pupil is applied to complete third nerve palsy. If it's an incomplete third nerve palsy, then even if the pupil is not involved, you should request for neuroimaging. Okay. So uh, these are... If it is associated with pain, Yes, of course. Any neurological sign and symptom. Absolutely. If patient complains of headache or pain, you should be uh, advising neuroimaging. So, in short, these are the most common scenarios that you'll be asked in uh, neuroophthalmology. As I said, what I would suggest is that uh, you note down what are the common situations associated with that condition. Let's say third nerve palsy, we, we discussed. Uh, NI superior, we discussed disc edema, unilateral disc edema, bilateral disc edema. Uh, these are the conditions that you should make a short list of because though we are exposure to neuroophthalmology generally would not be that great during our training. But the good point is that there are only six or seven situations that you're likely to encounter either in OSCE or in Viva or in your clinical practice. So with this, I end. Thank you, Santosh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Rashmi, for a wonderful uh, you know the overview of your ophthalmology in such a short time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think Ankita has collected all the questions. You can ask Rashmi. Minakshi has left, so no more questions for her. So. <laughs> Sir, I think sir has cleared up everything, sir. Till now, we haven't received any questions from the audience. Okay, that's nice. Yes, sir. You're sure, no? You've checked all the platforms? Yes, sir. Are there any questions on the chat? No, sir. Okay. Great. In that case, then we'll uh, say good night and uh, we'll uh, request you to attend the next OSCE session. That's on refraction, pharmacology and instruments. That's on Friday, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Thank you so much. Then. Good night. Thank you, Rashmi.